Uh, hi, everyone, and welcome to Compliance Panel's live webinar. And I'm David, your host today. And on behalf of Compliance Panel team, I would like to thank you for being part of this event. The topic for today's presentation is how does compliance with 21 CFR Part 11 help ensure data integrity and subject safety in clinical research to be presented by Dr. Charles H. Pierce. Now, Charles H. Pierce is MD, PhD, is a consultant in the clinical research drug device development arena where human subjects are involved. He has been in the clinical research industry more than 20 years and has been involved in developing phase one and a 2A clinical pharmacological, pharmacology unit, investigator and staff GCP training and medical monitoring in both drug and device studies. Uh, we're really honored to have uh, someone like Charles who just with us today to present this webinar. And before we begin, I would like to inform you of the program outline for this webinar. Uh, this event is for 60 minutes duration. Dr. Pierce will take you through today's webinar, highlighting the areas that will be covered, and he would then share with you his presentation. Now, for the purpose of avoiding discontinuity, we request all to hold back your questions until the Q&A window begins. Ten minutes of time will be allotted for the Q&A, during which your questions will be answered. And if for any reason you get logged out of this training session or teleconference, please follow the same procedure to join in again. Uh, I guess we're all ready to start. I request Dr. Pierce to take it from here. Charles? Thank you. Thank you, David. <clears throat> um, well, welcome to another compliance on, uh, panel uh, webinar. This one is about everything you wish you did not have to know about the process of electronic data processing or electronic data uh, capture. Uh, why do we need to know about this is that sooner or later, all clinical research data will be by electronic means. Now, my first seven plus years in the industry, I was with a paper only CRO, a good one, no uh, 483s, good audits. And the next one I joined was 100% electronic. And this was in 97, about the time that uh, uh, Part 11 first came out. Now, the key to any system to accumulate data in the drug and device development arenas is for universal acceptance. Now, this is an outline of Part 11, and we will be talking about how many of these points, uh, many of those points we're going to spend a little time with definitions, of course, and uh, electronic records, and a bit about electronic signatures. Now, I've, I repeated the electronic records because this is the important part that we're going to be uh, talking about. Uh, this is subpart B and C, which are the main things, and this will uh, hold our interest. Um, we're going to talk not about each and every one of these, but about some of the general principles uh, involved. In general terms, this is what I'll be talking about uh, as I acquaint you with Part 11. Perhaps what the regulation is, we'll define some terms, look at computerized systems, closed systems and open systems in their controls. Uh, internal audit questions is always important, and then we'll end up with electronic signatures and, of course, a word about SOPs, because uh, if you're going to go the computer route, uh, you need to start developing SOPs fairly early and they need to be fairly specific and of course there are SOPs for us, the folk, the non-IT people, and there are SOPs for the I people, IT people. Now, uh, Part 11 became effective in August of 97. Almost at once the industry became concerned about the interpretation implementation of the records that there were fears that the interpretations would read restrict the use of electronic technology uh, or significantly increase the costs of compliance or discourage innovation. And these were the excuses that they gave. So uh, in August of 2003, uh, the, in, the FDA came out with a guidance, uh, and they say basically that they will interpret Part 11 narrowly, but they're going to clarify that fewer records will be considered subject to Part 11, which means you don't have to go all Part 11. You can say only your data or only your um, data from uh, PK or, or some part of it. And for the records that remained subject to Part 11, uh, the FDA said that they intend to exercise enforcement discretion, quote, unquote. 
with regard to the requirements for the validation, for the audit trails, for the record retention and record copying. And, of course, they will also enforce all predicate rule requirements, including the rule record and record keeping requirements. And those are the most important things that they will be uh, being sure that uh, they take care of. <clears throat> now, this really memorializes or makes the information permanent about the actions, uh, activities, and, and results. And when you uh, see in my uh, slides, you'll see a reference, and that's Title 21, Code of Federal Relations, Part 11. And then I'll put as accurate as I can where, where this quote, quote particularly came from. Now, point three, if you remember from, from the earlier uh, stuff, point three is definitions. And this is a definition of, um, definition of what an electronic record means. But as you can see, it means almost anything. It can be audio, pictorial, or anything in a digital form. And uh, setting up a, a recent uh, CPU, I found that you can even get your height and weight to go directly into the computer. There is equipment to do that. Um, so you can go almost all electronic, but it's not really all that easy. Now, compare this to the traditional paper record where the data is recorded directly onto a stable medium. Uh, for those of you old enough to know what a typewriter is, <laughs> it was a device Anyway, so I won't go into that, just, just my sense of humor, but um, that the original paper document was considered very trustworthy. If I wrote something on a paper or typed it on a paper or printed it on a paper, that was it. It was trustworthy. But please know that a paper printout of an electronic record is not a traditional paper record. Mark that sentence. Mark that sentence in your, your handout. That is really, really important to keep up. The electronic signature, this is a definition, specifically delimitates how whatever system you end up using is a legally binding equivalent of the person's handwritten signature, legally binding equipment. This is a definition of an electronic signature as per the definitions in Part 11. The digital signature is really another way of saying, however you set up the identity of the signer uh, and the integrity of the data is verifiable. A digital signature, okay, means that I have signed it, the identity of the signer and the integrity of the data can be proven. And that's, you know, what you can, if you think about paper, you think what you're doing now, of course you prove it. Any time PI or somebody signs something, that's their signature. We can prove that that's their signature. Well, you've got to be able to do that electronically, okay? Whichever system is used, the persons responsible for the conduct, content, by the way, remain the same. Never forget that this statement, that one collects data as if someone lights, someone's life depends on it because it does. And I saw that in a CRO that I uh, visited uh, uh, for a, a meeting, and they had this sign, collect data as if someone's life depended on it, dot, 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 and then below that, because it does, all over that CRO. But whatever the system you have, closed access is controlled by someone who's responsible, or an open where the system access is controlled by uh, is not controlled by people who are responsible for the conduct. That's just, you know, something else that you need to keep in mind. More specifically, a closed system, uh, not only controlled by the person responsible for the contact, content of the electronic records, but you can also have a closed system that's a dial-in access, but you have to have an additional security connected with that, which people fail to realize. This, to my way of thinking, is very important to always keep in mind that unless you have good control, okay, unless you have good control of your electronic process, 
it is easier to change an electronic document than original paper. You know, your computer, you can go in and, and cut, copy, paper, paste. We can delete. We can move any one, and that's gone. But it can't be gone in an electronic record. Uh, a paper printout of electronic record is not, by the way, this is repeat. You saw this exact sentence before. The document is created electronically, and the content can be easily altered, okay? But you've got to be sure that you save, and it is saved, all of the original. And there must be a, it must be time-dated, and that we'll come back to. When a paper printout is generated from an e-record, it is the electronic record that controls and determines the content, the trustworthiness, and the reliability. That's an important thing to keep in mind. Now, the way to have a computer system create, maintain, archive, retrieve, and transmit data reliably is to systematically validate each step. And the term validation is essential for electronic data capture. To validate is to confirm by examination and provision of objective evidence that the computer specs conform to the user needs. Okay? and intended uses, and that all requirements can be consistently fulfilled. Confirmed by examination, okay, objective evidence that the computer system conforms to my needs, my user needs, so that it gives me the data in a reliable form when I am done. The elements of a computer system, this is not new, right? of the hardware, the software, any user manuals that you have around, what ties your system together? If you have an IT department, it's in another area. I mean, they've got to connect that, your, your uh, servers to your system, back up and all that network architecture that IT people will know about that I wouldn't expect any of us to know. And also, more important or very, very important are your training documents. Because, you know, we're all used to using computers, but we had to be trained somehow. Well, a computer medical record is a whole new level of, uh, of a computer system. Now, let's look at what the regs have to say about closed systems. And we'll look at the controls, the access to it, and the validation, as you might, as you might expect. First, we'll look at the controls of a closed system, okay? In a closed system, it is possible to discern invalidated, invalid or altered records. And to ensure accuracy uh, consistent with intended performance and ability to discern invalid or altered records. It's easy to change records electronically. The secret is for Part 11 compliance, or to do this right, is to know that whatever was there must be maintained, and there must be a time date stamp so you know if a, a thing was stated. Now, you'll notice that the Part 11, now we're doing a double digit, and that's in the electronic record, subpart B. And we're looking at subpart B in the first part. Remember in that slide earlier, there was 11.10, et cetera, is for... Uh, controls for the closed system. Okay, the system must also be able to produce complete, accurate, and verifiable records. Okay, a and verifiable copies of the electronic record on paper. In other words, we have to be sure that whatever's in the computer, it'll come out with some copy on paper that we can check or look at and make sure that you know, we, if we're going to go back in and change, we don't have to go every line. We can know exactly where to go. Is the system capable of producing complete and accurate copies of electronic records in the electronic form for inspection, review, or copying by the FDA inspector? The BMO system, by the way, I'm sure you're all aware, you've seen the, the FDA news uh, and Washington letter uh, note that the uh, – Inspections have greatly increased. They've almost doubled their staff, uh, I guess, to get the get the bad guys. Okay, 
not only must the records be retrievable, but who can retrieve them limited to authorized individuals. In other words, once a record is, is down, not everybody on the staff can go in and change those records. In paper, right. Almost anybody who had access to the, the notebooks of the subject, they could go in and change stuff, but not so electronic records. So you, your staff needs to be trained to do it right the first time. And that's a really, really important uh, differential. Now, it's essential that all data and records be time and date stamped so that an audit trail is beautiful. A secure computer generated time stamped audit trail. Now, what that means is that the computer, anytime there's a change, anytime there's a data goes in, it's, it's date and time to the second, literally, nanosecond, as those records will go in. So you think, well, that's good because now, you know, uh, mistakes coordinators make or mistakes the PI make, uh, you know, records will have them, have them right. Whatever you do, if you modify it, create it, delete, delete it, whatever, okay? But the information, all of the old information, the previous recorded information, still must be available for the FDA. A little scary, but that's the way it is, okay? Uh, uh, next one. Uh, the controls in a closed system must be well maintained, okay, so that accurate date and time stamping is done and that any changes do not obscure previously recorded information. And of course, the audit trail documentation should be retained just as long as you retain a, a, a paper. Those records would be retained and they would be saved. So, audit trail is essential. Okay? Part 11 regs seem to never tire of insurance, ensuring that controls are all over the place. The sequence of system steps okay, is enforced by the system. Does it allow only authorized individuals to use the system? Now, who's authorized? Uh, the computer would set up so that the PI can get into any record. Um, QA, QC auditors could get into records, but not everybody. Uh, uh, being a puncturist wouldn't be able to get into records that they're not their business. They could get into the record to write down the time that did the being a puncture if that's recorded. So authorized individuals, authorized for the specific job that the electronic record is. Uh, you know, PIs don't usually do the vital signs, so there would be some people doing the vital signs would be authorized to get into that particular data to be sure that it is it is as as correct. And of course, you can do vital signs straight electronic data capture these days. We looked at two or three companies that had this equipment uh, available for us. And again, the controls never seem uh, to end, including making sure that you have the right people right uh, people validating and working on your system. So you have to check, okay, to determine as appropriate the validity of the source data, of data input, and to determine the person who developed and maintained the record. Have the education training experience. It's just like, uh, you know, the, the PI must have the system, must be educated and licensed, of course, and have the training and experience to perform the PI duties. Well, same thing here. They want to be sure that the people who use electronic data know what they are doing. The regs even tell you to have written policies. Hmm, written policies, where have you heard that before? They do not use the term SOP, but they may as well have because we know better. Okay? Written policies to hold individuals accountable and responsible for Actions initiated under their signatures. That's, you know, that sounds like an SOP to me, and I'm sure to you also. Okay? As one goes through Part 11, you cannot help but understand that if you go electronic, you better know what you're doing. 
and you obviously need uh, experienced IT people, uh, not just people who are handy with computers. Um, revision and change control procedures to maintain the audit trail. Uh, you have to have many, many procedures, and these are well-defined. And I think this was one of the reasons that people say, oh, man, we can't do this right away because we didn't have IT people yet experienced in this area. Now, validation of a closed system is, again, clearly stated. I have a couple slides on this. To be maintained through physical and electronic controls, such as strict controls, firewalls, use of backup power. When you set up an IT department, you will have its a, a, a backup generator, a whole system, so that if there's a disaster and the power in the building or the hospital goes out, uh, you still have power to your electronic data. It must have uninterrupted power. And usually it is, uh, the generator goes on when that goes off. I mean, that's the way, way, way I've set them up. And the list goes on. Uh, installation. Only, only certain IT people can install anything. Now, we're all used to putting stuff in our computer. Uh, here's a new program. Well, I'm going to update this program. Not so in your electronic record uh, system in your unit or your hospital. It can only be done by uh, somebody who is authorized, not even the PI. There has to be limited access, certainly physically and technically. Um, I was medical director of a company, and uh, the only way I was allowed in the uh, IT offices is if I was uh, – guided, uh, had a someone with me who took me in there. I did not have uh, a key. That's one door I couldn't open. The other door I couldn't open was the pharmacy, right? That's where the, uh, that's where the uh, uh, data as far as the um, uh, business about randomization is on. Now, audit trails for systems, you have to have an audit trail for the system that you manage your data. And, of course, you've got to have, you know, a given workstation. You know, we had the computer on a table, and you move that around so people are working at it, but you've got to be sure that you know who is working at them and wh what they are at all time. You don't pass on something you've logged on. You log off every single solitary time. A twist on the typical closed system is one using a seemingly less secure, a seemingly less secure is dial uh, phone access. This could work but, as I mentioned earlier, another level uh, for added security for assessing the network via dial-up. And you should know what those are, and that's what is spelled out in the law, but your computer people would know that. There are some phone hookups uh, and phone dial-ups that are uh, secure. As no one else can get into them while you're on it, but you have to be sure that you are aware of that want to come back to the point I made earlier about an audit trail, what it is and what is required. What is an audit trail and what does an, an audit assess? Now, there's internal audits and there's external audits by the, maybe the sponsor, and certainly there's the audit trail that is always followed by the um, FDA inspectors when they come. It's the old who, what, and when story. They want to know, and everyone wants to know, who entered or changed the data, what was changed, if there was a change, and when, date and time, was the change made. Okay? Middle of the night? Hmm. So, believe me, it's, electronic data is, is bound to protect human subject safety, bound to uh, protect human data integrity, because it is so well controlled. Logical as it is, great data trails must first be secure. And yes, operator independent, computer generated, time and date stamped, and must be retained, as we said, and of course, bingo, available for FDA review. Now, it's just like paper, okay? Uh, the, aud the audit trail of paper is the same way. If I sign something and I put a different date on it, well, what if the next step 
there was a different date uh, that, that preceded that date, it, and that means that there has been a destroyed audit trail. So paper electronic, the audit trail is basically the same thing, but there are many more controls uh, for an electronic audit control. Now, I am aware of at least two CROs. They're almost 100% electronic data capture. And, of course, an internal audit uh, of these is going to follow. But when they do an internal audit, now the FDA is going to go, they look, you make sure that there are standard operating procedures. What's the security? Okay, Who can get into the system and who can't? What's the process? The audit trail. And we're going to talk about electronic signature because that's a bit tricky. What are your training records? And what's the validation processes? Some of these are uh, only IT language and only for the IT to know, but internal auditors, we've got to be sure that they check on those. SOP audits are the same whether you're on um, uh, EDC, electronic data capture or not. Yeah. Do SOPs exist? Are they maintained and updated on a yearly or six months or two yearly, whatever schedule that you have set up? Hmm. Are they followed? Are, the, are any of your PIs listening? Uh, are they compu communicated to all employees? Okay. And how are they communicated? So, and then, of course, you keep training records. And do, you, do the people really count, know them, and know them well? You know, that is a question because we don't we don't do testing, but uh, we're hoping that our our good people know them and practice them. Um, the fact is, as goes your computer uh, access security, so goes your general unit security. These go hand in hand. Okay, um, there are electronic means to facilitate access to the. Uh, data processing center, the computer center, your IT center, as well as to your building. And that's one of the big troubles uh, of uh, CPUs, clinical pharmacology units in hospitals, because the egos of some of the big peoples in the hospitals won't allow uh, or they won't spend the money to have the doors locked, that only people with certain key cards. The professor of medicine can't just walk in there. Uh, the dean of medicine can't just walk in there. And then who has access? Are there re records as to the who has the privilege? Who has the key card to get into the unit? And um, a unit must be secure. Uh, if I were a pharmaceutical firm, I would want to know who could come in to the unit while my study is going on. They are that, they're not secretive, but they're that careful with the confidentiality of the data. What safeguards are in place to prevent unauthorized use of passwords? In other words, an SOP to not pass on passwords is really essential. ID codes. Um, what's your safeguards? Okay. How do you keep people from getting into the computerized systems? Okay. And then you got to have really a high level of uh, computer virus protection. And I suspect uh, most of them I know are, are uh, PCs and, uh, you know, Word, Microsoft-based, but, you know, there, there isn't a virus problem with the, the Mac, so that, that might be coming down the, down the pike. And how are records protected to maintain retrieval? Really, really important. In addition, how you manage your data is basically the same whether or not you are electronic, okay? I mean, you you, sec you secure your data um, if you're paper. You have a backup procedure and recovery procedures if you're paper. Uh, store it, well, it's a little different with, with paper. You have to store it, and that's, that's your recovery. If it gets burned in a fire and it's paper and it's the original, you, you may have a little bit of trouble there. Now, are the records secure, okay? Um, you look down that list, I mean, it's, you know, uh, there are, for any time you have electronic data, there's new versions, new programs come out. You know, the half-life of a computer, when I first started using computers, was about three years. Uh, I think the half-life today is, if we're lucky, it's, it's three months, is, is 
think you're all, all aware. Now, an important internal audit question is the maintenance of security of the audit trails. By security, there can be no way that any piece of data can be modified without the full authority and without full authority of whoever is doing it, and even then, the original data must not be erased. Modifiable without approval cannot happen. Editable, maybe possibly, but by whom? The main thing is that they must be secure. Very, very important for audit trails. This is internal audit trails and external. Um, all companies with paper have a QA department and they go back and they check and make sure everybody's doing everything right. They know the regs and they know uh, how to follow audit trails to help us, to help us. Another related audit question concerns the identification of who has electronic signature authority, okay? Do the records contain information as to who the signer is? Is there a printed name someplace? The date and time when the signature was executed and stored electronically. You know, review and approval of anything associated with that signature. The PI should be able to, yes, he does the physical examination, he does um, checks on the data, of all safety data, the adverse events and that, but, uh, and he would sign these when they're done or sign them if he's reviewed them at a certain time. Um, but there should not only the PI's specifically uh, uh, name and signature is related to that, but this must be verified and backed up. And our signatures related to the level of responsibility, that seems pretty obvious, okay? Now, associated with an audit is always training records. That's not new, okay? And you'll note correctly that this list is for both uh, EDC, electronic data capture, and paper data capture. This is no different. You probably have uh, this same list in your in your unit. Now back to EDC, the validation I mentioned earlier remains top priority, top priority for both the hardware and everything else. Certainly the hardware is, is one of the main things, okay? And the software, uh, what processes do you validate the software? You don't just buy it off the shelf, you test it and validate it, okay? Is there a plan? Is there a report of validation? And the, where's the approval process? Who approved? And if your ID department would approve. So that, that's why uh, the 97 part 11 was basically in a way shelved. I come back to it because it is really important to know it because it's eventually gonna come back and all data will be electronic in the future, the FDA just cannot handle the semi-load of, of paper that it used to, it used to uh, have to go through. Now, does the validation report evaluate how your process demonstrates that the design specs were met? I mean, this is the validation process for anything, even a chemistry method, okay? Well, let's get back on track and look at open systems for a bit the same questions need to be uh, answered. So there's nothing really new between open and closed. You have to answer the same, same questions. Again, the controls we look at, controls, access, and validation, doesn't surprise anybody. Part 11, subpart B.30, and that's controls for open system, and this is from subpart B, and that's what we'll be talking about for the next, uh, next little bit. But first we'll go back to a definition, right? This is a single digit here. Um, open systems, as you might logically expect, must have all the controls of a closed system, plus, as I have mentioned four or five times, additional controls such as super firewalls, uh, antivirus software, and a far more elaborate rules for authentication because you're using an open system uh, via a telephone link. Now, this is a this is in your uh, definition. 
Now, what it says in the regs is that it is clear that procedures and uh, controls are complicated, okay? Um, to maintain confidentiality, authenticity, integrity uh, is not easy to do, but you have to be, do them to maintain uh, an open system. Everyone's advice is to not use it, but today that's probably the most common thing that's used. Okay, there are a number of types as well as ways to use encrypt encryption keys, including a number of steps to go online. Um, each user might have a series of keys in addition to a regular ID and password. I was working for a company and the encryption key was a, um, a device that I put into the, uh, one of the ports of the computer. And that identified me because I kept that on me at all times. And that allowed me to get into that computer. And then it also, that encryption device uh, uh, limited the areas that I could go into. I couldn't go into administrative, I couldn't go into payroll, I couldn't do a lot of things. And that's the way it should be, okay? Um, the control of the signatures in an open system is even more important to the integrity of the data. Uh, often external devices plus an ID verification and the ever-changing password is used and the system used must be validated. Uh, any combination of code or password, and that has to be maintained, any combination must be maintained. So when you have, you're trying to control a signature, and this is the, the third digit, which is 11.30, is controls for identification codes uh, in subpart C. Now, we're just jumping ahead a little bit just to, to show you a little bit about the, the, the signatures. Uh, this, it would seem, is a com is common sense, but it's also difficult to enforce because people are people, and even the not so computer challenged have some difficulty with ever changing passwords, and specifically different passwords for different studies. There are some groups that have tried that. I don't recommend it, but your signature control must ensure that the the code and the password, et cetera, are checked and recalled or revised what, whatever, whenever they're needed, okay? Now, then how do you handle problems, okay? Lost, stolen, missing, compromised tokens or uh, keys, key cards or whatever they're called, cards or other devices that bear or generate ID code, you know? How do you handle problems? Companies that plan carefully and cover every potential emergency or demand handle this better than those who just plain wing it. So an experienced IT people, someone who knows part 11 backward and forward is essential if you want to go all EDC, electronic data capture. So we start off slow, and that's what the uh, the uh, 2003 guidance document uh, talks about. To cover all your bases is the best policy. And that's what uh, point D brings out. The answer is to validate and test and retest and retest and retest. Just like the uh, emergency medical system, for example, a phase one unit, right? I can have one on paper that says I've got an arrangement with a hospital and I can get subject to that hospital in four minutes. Uh, show me some test records. Show me why you've done it, okay? Not enough to have it on paper or in an SOP. You have to periodic test of the devices, tokens, the cards, and the, all, all that you have to ensure that they properly function and have not been altered. I had to turn in my key, this little device that I plugged in the computer, uh, about every month, and it was not exactly. Sometimes it was three weeks, sometimes it was five weeks, and I never knew. They would just say, uh, a quick check, and it was put into another computer, and bing, 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 they gave it back to me. That was good testing. I was very pleased that they guarded 
the integrity of the data to that level. Okay, let's hone in on electronic signatures and how to link the signature to the record. Really, really, really important. Electronic signatures can be technically complex, and not all technologies support environments where the, such signings are even possible. First, you must have an identification and verification mechanism uh, to the individual signing the event or the action to be executed. Okay? And the execute must be legally binding to the individual's handwriting written signature. So this must be tested and retested. Whatever combination of symbol or series of symbols or key or password must be legally binding to the individual. That's back on your definitions, right? 11.3. Okay, an electronic signature refers to the act of attaching a signature by electronic means through the computer, uh, and this can be done by a variety of ways and has more than one meaning, okay? Whatever you mean, it just means that the person with the intent to sign the record signed the record. And they signatures can be digital or any way that you set it up, whether it's key card, whether it's password or whatever, that, that's fine. That, that you can do, okay? Linking the electronic signature to the correct study is a crucial step. Uh, uh, part, subpart B11.7 deals with linking the signature uh, with the specific record. And the signature cannot be removed, okay, uh, or transferred. So to falsify electronic records is very, very, very difficult. And that's the reason the FDA is wanting to, uh, I mean, they're tired of, of uh, all these docs and other people who falsify records or CRAs or whoever's doing it, uh, even sponsors. They're tired of that. And so, yes, now they've increased the number of investigators, but if, it's all, if everyone was electronic, you really can't falsify it very, very, very much. Uh, these are some of the rules that must be established to ensure that uh, electronic signatures are valid, uh, unique to one person, not a whole series of PIs and sub-PIs. Each one has to have their own. They have to have at least two components, yes, an ID and a password, or uh, uh, maybe three, an ID and a password um, and uh, a key, something you plug into your computer used only by the genuine or I as a PI cannot pass on my key or my passwords to anybody else and passwords age. What happens if I lose it? Okay? And that has to be taken care of by SOP, has to be taken care of by electronically. And then how do I uh, safeguard unauthorized uh, uses? There has to be several ways. Anybody unauthorized is going to probably try to get into areas that they, they shouldn't get into. This is an example of an actual screen. You know, it says password expired, okay? Here's my old password. Well, what, what if I, I borrowed this and I, I've come into this and I don't know my old one? Therefore, I can't get new passwords. And if I don't know my old one, and this particular way, way is set up, bingo, I'm out. Now, this came from an actual EDC company um, what they used, and they uh, passed uh, this is on to me for use uh, today. Now, if there's been any inordinate amount of time or for any reason there's a possibility of a security breach, this type of screen might show up, okay? For security reason, your connection has been locked. Too much time, and, there, you know, it's set up that I can, the PI can only spend so much time uh, uh, with the, let's say, the causality of the adverse event or looking at the serious adverse event form and so forth. So then uh, this person, and this was happening to be, the company is Medrio, you've maybe heard of it, and they have to put their password or, and this would unlock it so the computer would go back in, or bingo, go to my password, I got to log out. And that's in your, in your data stamp, okay? Let's turn our attention to some general 
thoughts about the key requirements of Part 11. Yes, validation, security, audit trails, and record retention and record protection. Okay? The reason for the need for regulation is to ensure that electronic data systems have the same end as the well-known paper system. Okay? The overall reason is data integrity, which translates to ensuring subject safety. Computer systems and electronic records store vital corporate data, right, as well as business operations, in addition to data that the FDA rely upon. And if the, high, if the data quality is high, you bet subject safety is protected. Okay? To ensure that the data is accurate and authentic, a number of controls have to be put into place. And we've been through these and even monitoring system to get into the building, okay? And there must be, I mentioned this before, IT control of all hardware and all software, not just anybody. So these are just a few of the controls. We can look at those. There's more, okay? There has to be change control, document control, backup and archival procedures, and training. Anything new or revised, you have to train people. Uh, people today are used to computers, okay? My kids all called me computer challenge. You know, they grew up with computers. Um, I didn't. Anyway, so the, all these things have to be really uh, kept in mind. Now, I wish to conclude this talk uh, by bringing up one way we are all familiar with in the clinical research arena, and that is the importance of standard operating procedures. Control of software, hardware and software, that's the uh, SOP in the IT department. Monitoring process, your QA department, and everyone else should know what the QA people are going to do. Any transfer of data from one form to another. And how does your personnel handle electronic uh, data capture? Now, you're going to need SOPs in the validation procedures, uh, in change uh, control, system validation, monitor, monitoring violation attempts, computer virus protection. Your staff needs to know that, you know, viruses are there, and you have to, if something doesn't work 100%, Bingo, you call your IT people and you, you shut down because you don't want to ruin uh, the data that you have. Access to computer room. Only people who know what they're doing are in the computer room, okay? And then date and time setting. And there has to be a, uh, an SOP so that uh, on a regular basis, the computer time, time, date, and state and time stamp is the same as the electronic record and is the same as on your wall. So all these have to be, have to be uh, set up. And this is some more suggestions. Let me call your attention to uh, granting permission uh, to the sponsor regarding uh, access to data. Sponsor can't just walk in and, and get this data. They can't. You have to make sure you give it to them. You can send it to them. Um, but they just can't walk in and use the PI's, you know, uh, ID and password to get in. Um, and of course, disaster recovery. Wow, you've got to have that, whether you whether you like it, like it or not. And then, uh, you know, for the IT department, uh, continuous data management, study specific database collection. Um, code management, electronic file. I mean, all these things, electronic data capture, system maintenance, among others. I mean, I haven't been exhaustive here, but these are the ones that, that I've seen. Now, this sounds very basic, but any of us with a history of management will assess the importance of each and every point. I want, I was chief operating officer of a, of a CRO, a 200-bit CRO, and I wanted everyone in, that, in, in my group, my company, to know what our policies were and SOPs and to follow them. And nobody was to reveal their password to anybody. Uh, you know, everyone, 
everyone would have a password based on what they were supposed to do. You know, don't open emails. This is not electronic data capture. This is common sense. And I, I hope you have a policy in SOP about uh, inter-office communication. You be very, very careful with emails. They aren't destroyed. They are on your computer. You can delete them, but they're still they're still there. And then, of course, uh, if you have a laptop, be careful what's on it, and you've got to have your your personal control at all times. You know, finally, uh, these should not have to be said, but with a history of management uh, that I have, I can attest the importance. I I want to be sure that no one can install hardware or so software, either one, but software can be installed by nobody, okay? I need, I want people to understand the significance of systems and applications that allow specific entry in the data, specific modification of the data and reporting or analysis of regulated data. That has to be really an important area. And no one comply with the SOPs and company policies at all time. Wow. That's new stuff, eh? <laughs> in the end, and I, I always end with this slide on all my webinars, but even though I say a physician who in clinical research is still a physician, remember a nurse is still a nurse, a CRA is still a CRA, people are still people, and all these people will take great care in the aspects of the care of the study participants, okay? Now, the PI is responsible as a physician, um, but other people are people. They care. I have not run into a CRA or nurse that did not care for the people. So this, even though I've said physician, I mean everybody. And this care includes virtually everything, everything that we do. Okay, let's open the mics. I thank you um, for your time. And it looks to me like uh, it's uh, 3 o'clock. Eastern Standard Time. <laughs> All right. Uh, by the way, you will see uh, um, some references, and I'll go quickly to this before I go back. Uh, this is the reference for Part 11, and this is the uh, August 2003 uh, guidance that says, well, we're not going to follow this exactly, and I recommend uh, this be read. Um, but also there was a came out uh, – Department of Health and Human Services, FDA, it came out with in May 2007, um, you know, starting to talk again about using computerized systems. Okay. And then, by the way, a uh, list of some future planned webinars, uh, and a couple of them I've already given, but uh, and then some information about Compliance Panel. It's a good group. You should follow what they're, they're doing. And then some, the last uh, slide is information about how to contact them uh, if you want to make any comments. Now let's open the mics and uh, open where right. anybody asks any questions. You can, I'll, I can write them. You can write Thanks them there. Very much, John. Thank you very much for the wonderful presentation and all the participants for cooperating with us. It is time for the Q&A. And uh, I'll go ahead and unmute both the groups, and uh, you can ask your questions. And if someone would like to type in your questions, I request you to use the Q&A panel. So you, would, you may do so as well. And if for any, any reason you're unable to ask your questions, doubts, please share it with me, your host, by chat, and I shall get the answer from a presenter. And in the meantime, I will feedback in the feedback form that will appear on your screen in the polling window. All right, I'll just unmute uh, uh, Mr. Kistner. Do you have any questions? No, come, it wasn't that oh. clear. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I mean. Todd McWilliams or Todd Kistner, the two groups. Do you have any questions? I've uh, passed one mic to both of you. Um, I do have a quick question. This is Todd Kistner with Metafax International. Um, Dr. Pierce, you had uh, indicated uh, about the middle of the slideshow that, that any hardware associated with uh, uh, open systems should be validated. Um, I have some questions, some general questions about hardware validation. We validate the software, um, but maybe you could give just a, a brief summary of, of hardware validation in that world. Uh, 
Oh boy, that is that is the the trickiest part of the two, and I, I suspected that you would uh, know to ask that question. Um, the, the hardware validation is usually the specs of it, and that uh, the hardware does what it says it's going to do, because the hardware is usually validated by the company that sold it to you. Uh, they would have gone through a uh, a fairly large procedure. I mean, if you're buying a, a computer from Dell or you're buying a computer from Hewlett Packard, uh, they have had to validate it. So uh, for our purposes, this is less important. Uh, I'm speaking more about hardware like uh, I told you that you could get your height and weight, um, your height and weight into electronic um, uh, configuration. I've, I've seen the machine. The, the, you stand on it, and the slide goes up and puts your height. You've got your weight, and bingo. No one has to write down anything. It goes right straight to the computer. But that has to be validated by putting numerous weights, numerous uh, heights, and testing it, making sure that it, in fact, 100% uh, of the time gives you the correct height and weight. The vital signs, like you... Um, I don't know. Uh, well, I'm blanking, but there are a number of vital signs uh, where you get the uh, blood pressure, the heart rate, the uh, uh, PO2 uh, temperature uh, on a device, and that can go directly into the computer without anybody having to write that down. Uh, but you also need to test that, and you need to validate so that your elect internal electronic sensor your IT people have set up so that um, um, uh, what is what ends up on the record electronically was what uh, the machine read, and so you have to do checks on that. That's that's how you validate the hardware. I wasn't really talking about the computer or the server server because in fact those are validated by the manufacturer. Does that answer your question? Partly? At all? <laughs> Can I ask a question here from St. Jude? Yep. So um, you mentioned uh, very briefly this access uh, when uh, sponsors come from the outside to come in and look at electronic patient medical records to verify data. Uh, and obviously, you know, warn people not to give your password away, blah, blah, blah. But can you, can you um, provide some models of how this is done in different scenarios? Um, uh, do you request that your IT department create a separate file for those patients? Well, what do you mean? They, they come in and ask for... Um, um, they come in and ask for data on a given patient, like an audit? Yeah, they want to come and verify that the data that you have given them uh, from the source document, which is an electronic record, um, and, and so they they want to sit there with the hospital computer verifying that data. And you clearly told us correctly that, you know, we don't give them our password and our name. So how do different places... Uh, make this happen? Do they talk to their medical record IT department to create a separate file for those patients that they can access? Do you just give them paper reports? Uh, what, what, can you give us some different models? Because as you know, this is happening more and more. Yes, um, it is. And you mentioned one word that sort of scared me. You said hospital computers. Uh, that is very difficult to secure. Uh, I'm, I'm you know, a CPU computer, that stays in the CPU. Hospital computers are used by everybody, and you'd have to have a uh, – it's real difficult to be sure that that data um, is – I mean, I, I need to know that that's not accessible to anybody. Now, there's, there's three ways, basically, that can be done. Yes, a paper record, here's the data, a printout. Now, if they say, well, how do I know the printout is what the electronic data is? Right. Uh, uh, the next thing would be to give them, here's a, a temporary uh, ID and password that you can use. This is valid for 24 hours or, you know, whatever whatever 
time that that you would want it uh, valid for. And um, but the problem with that second model is that that gives them wide access, not just to the population of their interest, unless you restrict. Oh, oh no, 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 no. And then it's it's set. You give them the the, the password and username get, get, given to them. The IT department limits it to exactly what um, they requested. I mean, the IT department should be allowed More. to restrict the data uh, at, at any level that they want. Now, the other way and the most common way that I've seen is that uh, 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 someone someone from the group meets with them, uh, literally opens up the data and says, "What do you want?" and, and and you know gets gets to them uh goes with them and and opens up the data that they want uh they they should or would never be left alone to peruse data at, in any case okay because a sponsor has a conflict of interest and a sponsor could uh change data could change data so that it uh, um, it, it's to their advantage, and that's that's what you really don't want. Okay, Mr. thank Barr, you. I mean, there there are a lot of ways to handle that, but you got to be sure that you really you really have it controlled. Um, are there any other questions, Todd? Yeah, that was, a, that was actually a very, very good question. It's, it's one of the biggest, I, I think, problems because sponsors do send monitors, and these monitors uh, want data, and the monitor uh, should be allowed to look at some, but, of course, they couldn't change any. They couldn't change if, even if they wanted to, they couldn't change it, um, and they should only be allowed into certain aspects or, you know, certain patients if that's what you want. I mean, you, you set the parameters upon which they're allowed to work. The IT people can do that. Don't ask me how. All right. Uh, I thought, are there any other questions? Are you still with us? All right. Uh, all right. Well, thank you very much again for participating in this webinar. And if you would like to get in touch with us, you can send us an email at webinars at compliancepanel.com. Or if any of you feel that you or your team members uh, or colleagues would benefit from this webinar, uh, we are happy to inform you that it will be available in the recorded format and can be purchased from a webinar, or you can call us at 714-441-5856. We welcome your suggestions and feedbacks or ideas on how to improve our webinars. If you'd like to suggest a topic or desire a customized corporate training, online or on-site, we ensure that whatever is your training necessity, it will be a priority. We look forward to having you with us sometime soon again and for continued patronage. Thank you once again and have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.